Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California Midwifery Advisory Council meeting, pursuant to the provisions of Governor Gavin Newsom's Executive Order N29-20, dated March 17, 2020. This meeting is being conducted via WebEx. Public comments will be heard for each agenda item for individuals wishing to do so. To be ready for public comment, we ask that you please ensure that your comments can be heard clearly by being connected to the audio of this meeting through the proper method. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you're connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you do have difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video menu option at the top of the WebEx application and then select switch audio. You will see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code and attendee ID that will be used to connect to the meeting audio via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you are having audio problems with your device, this will allow you to still participate and hear the audio of the board meeting. Please see the instructions on how to connect link on the last page of the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, Ms. Holzer, and you can now start the meeting. Right, so welcome everybody to the Member Free Advisory Council meeting. I'm Diane Holzer, the chair of the Advisory Council. So again, I apologize deeply for not being able to connect. I did try. Ms. Holzer, can you move your microphone closer? Okay, can you hear me now? I think you're gonna have to speak up. Oh no, this isn't working either. That's what I was trying we to- We can hear you, but it's very, it's not as loud as it could be. Okay, all right, I'll try and, and project. I just wanted to once again apologize for being a little late. I really did try to start getting on at 1230 and it was crazy today. Anyway, so I, since this meeting is being conducted via WebEx, um, I will ask all the MAC members and speakers to announce themselves by name uh, before speaking for clarity of the official record. All MAC members are able to unmute themselves to speak during the meeting. Please place yourself back on mute when not speaking to reduce background noise for all participants. Following such online meeting etiquette will ensure the best audio quality for everybody. During each call for comments from MAC members and speakers, we will ensure that all comments that can be accommodated are heard before, proce before proceeding with the agenda. Government Code Section 11126.5 allows the board to remove people who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room or virtual space if order cannot be restored by removing or muting the disruptive people. During each agenda item, the host moderating this WebEx event will activate the Q&A and hand raising features of WebEx and we will ask everyone, anyone wishing to make a public comment to indicate so by replying yes in the Q&A or by raising their hand. The host will then call on individuals who indicated they wish to make public comments by name. When called upon, the host will unmute the microphone of the individual and they will to make their public comment. After the comment, the individual will be placed back on mute. Please see the agenda for WebEx instructions on how to connect on the agenda and additional instructions. The board's IT staff will assist me with receiving the public comments via WebEx during this meeting. MAC members, as a reminder, during today's meeting, any items requiring a vote will be done by a roll call vote. This means that once the motion is made and seconded, Ms. Moriarty will call each of the names individually to request their vote. I would now like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Moriarty uh, call the roll. Ms. Abe? I'm present. Thank you. Ms. Brelia? I'm present. Thank you. Ms. Corinne? Present. Thank you. Ms. Webster? Present. Thank you. And Ms. Holzer? Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Great. So then we're going to move to agenda item number two, public comments not on the agenda. Are there any public comments? I've gone ahead and opened the Q&A window. Uh, for anyone wishing to make a public comment, you can type anything in that Q&A window. There is also a hand raising feature that you can use in the WebEx. And I do see one uh, call-in user online. There is a, a new call-in functionality to raise your hand on the call-in only lines. If you would like to make a public comment as a call-in user, please press star three on your phone's dial pad and it will trigger hand raise on the inside here for uh, me to call upon you. Um, a little different since we're using a new version of WebEx that has a closed captioning feature. There's also a few other features available. And one of them is that when you request to make a public comment and we call upon you, uh, you will receive a prompt on your end to open your line yourself. 
Um, all we do is trigger that prompt. You actually have to accept that prompt in order to make a public comment. So when we call on you, please be at your computer so you can press that button to uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, first up, we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, let me get your line open here in just a sec. Okay, Rosanna, you should be seeing a prompt now on your side. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rosanna Davis, president of California Association of Licensed Midwives. I really appreciate everyone being here today. There's been an excellent turnout. I know that for some, these meetings can be frustrating and we all find ourselves wondering if it's, if it's the best use of our time and energy, which brings me to the following proposal. I'm of the opinion that these meetings would be best suspended while we focus our efforts on the formation of a licensed midwife board. Because the MAC has no regulatory authority, the costs associated with staff time and resources to run these meetings will only continue to drain the program fund without benefiting the midwifery profession or the public. In short, MAC meetings are an inappropriate use of funds that are intended to advance the profession and protect and serve the people of California. I would also like to recommend that until a licensed midwife board is established, midwifery program reports be presented directly to the medical board which for the time being remains our regulatory authority. This proposed change is necessary and overdue, especially in light of the fact that the medical board doesn't otherwise receive this information and that these reports represent a use of staff time and expertise that is both valuable and essential. As you may know, CALM has invited the medical board to co-sponsor a bill this legislative cycle to form a licensed midwife board. We look forward to redirecting our collective efforts away from the MAC and towards building a productive and sustainable regulatory program for community-based midwifery in the state of California. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, if anyone else would like to make a public comment, please indicate so by raising your hand or typing something in the Q&A window. And uh, Rosanna Davis is also mentioning Ms. Holzer that she's having a very hard time hearing you. It, it is very faint. Maybe we could take opportunity to just have you call in now. It doesn't seem like the mic is actually active on your headset. So uh, instead of troubleshooting that further now, maybe we should just have you call in and do the speakerphone. So if you remember the uh, audio and video up at the top, we'll give you a switch audio option and then you can um, get the call-in number and attendee information you need to join there. Maybe we could just take a break right now and do that. Um, but at this point, I'm not seeing any additional public comment requests. So I would call in, right? Yeah. And it should give you all everything you need there on the screen. And as soon as you call in with your phone, it'll disconnect your computer's audio and switch you over to the call. You can probably leave it on speakerphone and be the easiest too, so you don't have to hold it there the whole time. Might I suggest um, Claudia to continue until her 
or is it working? I just want to ask on everybody's time. Ms. Holzer, do you have any trouble? And it's just the same. It hasn't switched over yet. You can't hear me? Huh? Well, we can hear you just the same way we could hear you before. You should just be able to dial that number and enter in the meeting ID and the attendee ID and it will automatically convert you over. Okay, Ms. Holder. Now go ahead on your computer, hit the unmute button. Okay, so you can hear me this way? Much better. Uh, okay, all right. Apologies once again. Okay, so we're still in public comment or have we, are we, is there anyone else for public comment? Uh, at this time, I don't see any other requests for public comment. All right. So then let's move to agenda item number three, approval of the minutes from the August 12th, 2021 uh, Midwifery Advisory Council meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the August MAC meeting minutes from the members? No, seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from the MAC meeting? Motion to approve. Second. Is there any public comment regarding the uh, meeting minutes from August? Yes, I've heard first year we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, give me just a second to get your line open. You should be seeing that prompt again on your side. There you go, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I have two requests. The first is simple. I would just like it on the record um, that my full name be included rather than just Ms. Davis identifying me so as not to confuse me with the other Ms. Davis that we all know and love. And is it possible to uh, um, get my full comments uh, in the written record? I have submitted them to Ms. Webb. Um, I just want to say that the, the minutes are a summary of the comments, but of course the, the video of the meeting is available online and that has everyone's full statements. Okay, thank you. Is there any other public comment on the meeting minutes? Uh, this time I do not see any additional requests. All right then, uh, Mrs. Moriarty, can you please perform the roll call vote? Yes, Ms. Abe? Yes. Ms. Brelia? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Curran? Yes. Ms. Webster? Abstain. And Ms. Holzer? Yes. Thank you. So the August MAC meetings have been approved. Great. And moving to agenda item number four, the report from the Midwifery Advisory Chair. Um, First of all, I'd like to welcome our new member, Monique Webster, um, who is sitting in the position of the consumer advocate. Um, Monique has served on the MAC previously, and we are so grateful that she's willing to return and do, do the work for the council. 
Um, Thank you. Yes. And secondly, it's with uh, sadness that we are saying goodbye to Dr. Marie Adams, who has served this council for many years. We, were so we are so grateful for her contribution and will miss her wisdom and her on-point counsel and genuine engagement with the midwifery community and midwifery issues. We will be putting out a call. We are putting out a call for the vacancy of her position. Um, you can see that posted on the California Medical uh, Board website. So if any of you know any physicians who would be interested in filling this position, it would be fabulous if you could forward them to the, to the website to apply for that position. Um, and Tanya reminded me right before the meeting that um, both myself and Danielle Abe uh, will be coming to the end of our terms this June, which means we're going to be putting out a call for our vacant positions as well, and we'll be voting on those during the March meeting. So um, once again, and if you know anybody who wants to, I will be trimming out. I will not be um, going up for a re-election, Danielle, if she wishes, could, could go up for re-election. So there will be two, two seats um, available. Um, this is going to be our last meeting of 2021. It's been a pretty stressful year, um, another year of meeting by WebEx, but I think we've managed to persevere and get things done, even, even, even so. Um, I don't know how to put this in the context of, of Palm's request that we suspend our meetings, but I feel like we've, we have accomplished some things. It's not a total waste of time that we've been doing. We've welcomed several new, new members and have re reactivated our Medi-Cal task force, which is really exciting to me. I've been wanting to put that on our radar for a long time. Um, we, we, um, the Medical Board approved our suggested amendments regarding regulatory language change to the LMAR. Uh, regarding races and ethnicity, data that we desperately do need to collect that we weren't collecting. I think that's a great thing that we got accomplished this year. We drafted and sent a letter to the offices of Social Security and birth registrars to clarify, to clarify midwifery services and, prevent, and try and prevent issues with obtaining birth certificates for midwifery clients. Um, we coordinated and held an interested parties meeting regarding creating midwifery regulations, which has been in stalemate for, for quite a while. And I think, I think that considering that we only meet three times a year and it's been a pandemic, I think actually we should applaud ourselves for what we have been able to accomplish. And as always, big, big gratitude um, to all the staff for, for their dedication without which none of this um, would happen. And I do look forward to the next year and maybe even a meeting in person next year. That's all I have today. Thank you, Diane, for saying uh, that list of accomplishments. Those are important wins. <laughs> you know what they say, it's a, what did they say? It's a pebble, right? It's a pebble. Right. <laughs> Little pebbles. Are there any questions or, or comments? Or any public comments? The Q&A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, you can do so by typing anything in there. You can also use the raising hand functionality in WebEx. And if there's any call-in users on the line, you can press star three in order to raise your hand. Okay, this time, Solzer, I'm not seeing any requests. All right. Then we can move on to agenda item number five, establishing goals for the Midwifery Advisory Council. And I myself don't have any goals for us to add to our already full plate. Um, do any of the other members of the council have something that they would, a goal that they would like to propose? Mm, none at this time. Well, I, can I ask a question? Um, is there, I looked at the list of approved schools um, but is there anything uh, like a user-friendly handout that really tells um, schools kind of the process or people interested in expanding midwifery education? I guess I was, that's a question, but I don't know if, if that's 
a goal or anything, but I just noticed the website really doesn't have a good, it just has approved schools, but it doesn't have any way, any material or anything. And I've called myself and it just, I didn't get the like answer I was looking for. So that's just a little thing I noticed that it's, that's lacking information. So maybe um, taking a look at that and trying to come up with some better um, wording for content about the schools that are that are um, accredited, you mean, or that are accepted for, for midwifery licensure? Is that what you mean? Yes, or even how to expand that list, because there's only one school in California. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the schools do have to apply, right, and be accepted. So I think her question is, how does that work? Because there is no guidelines for that. How does Thank this you. apply? Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, how would the, you as a public, a citizen of California, you know, or even in public health, because there's funding now in public health to to work on midwifery training. So what what is the public to do? There's no recourse, no handbook. I was told I was sent the law when I called. And that's not very user friendly for my committee work to be sent the law. So I just think this, that it's a disservice to the citizens. There's no way, there's one school in California and there's no, no handbook on how to, there's no 10 step, there's not even three steps, so. I think that's a great, that's a great um, goal to get some more information on the website. There's also, I mean, we may want to be taking a look at that anyways because of the new omnibus bill, right? What was it, 365 that went through that there's, mandates and I believe funding available to midwifery training programs to increase um, diversity within the programs, right? So if we only have one school, we, we maybe we need to have more schools <laughs> and more information. So, I mean, I think that's, how would we, uh, and that's maybe just a goal is to, to look at, um, wording, you know, that we could put the process, because there, there, there is a process, I couldn't name it to you off the top of my head what it is, but I know that there is a process to be accepted as a school. But maybe we could put that process, at least a brief outline of that process on the website. Does that seem like something we could do? Staff, I'm asking you. I don't know who to ask. Well, everything flows from from the law, but I think that's a, a interesting idea that staff can consider um, uh, maybe providing some more user friendly terms uh, with reference to the statutory language. So that, but I mean, to, we could is it something? Is that a goal that we could do? Would be to help with just explaining on the website how a school would apply or? Certainly. Okay. All right. Danielle, so. are you looking for instructions on how to start a school in California or how to get an existing school approved? I don't know about existing schools, but the last thing that uh, Diane said, you know, and Carrie mentioned, just like an outline of the steps, the overall process. I mean, it's a barrier. There's one school and who do you contact? There's no place to contact. And again, when you well, call, you refer to the law. So if you're, if, if you're taking that Momni bus and you're working on committees and trying to get a lay of like, what should I do? There's no like, what you know most people don't understand the law so yeah there's just something straightforward like prepare your packet you know it, whatever it just could be more user friendly is is a so, good first step is what i was thinking so danielle the first step is you have to have a school and it has to be approved in california and then it can be approved by the medical board so I'm thinking and specifically, Claudia, thank you for clarifying of the community colleges of which there are like 30 or so in allied health and even because I'm in allied health at a community college. And uh -huh. even for me to explain to the community college what you do, there's like crickets right. <laughs> there. And, you know, we're talking about skilled people. There's like blank faces like, oh, OK. 
So, I mean, I get, it's still just unclear. Right. So, Danielle, I do know a bunch about that. So, if you would like to put a goal like that as one of our goals, I will work on that with you. Fabulous. Sure. It's a great goal. Or, yeah, it sounds like a lot of people are willing. So, yay. <laughs> and whatever level we need to do, because um, it's Miss Webb seemed to have a suggestion, which I thought was not bad. Okay. Okay, so that's good. So we can't, of course, we can't talk about it today, but we can put it on our um, agenda for our next meeting to talk about it. And I think if if you want to do some research um, before we come to meeting, then we can have some, even maybe maybe even even some suggested wording. So we'll put it on the agenda for next meeting. Great, good goal. Thank you, Danielle. Okay. Um, any anything else that people want us to work on? All right. Are there any questions or comments uh, from the public? Again, the Q and A window is open for anyone wishing to make a comment. You can type it in there. You can raise your hand or if you're on the phone lines, you can press star three to raise your hand via phone. A few seconds here. Okay, first up we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, let me send you that request. Should be seeing it now. Sorry, Rosanna. Rosanna, there yes. you go, your line's open. Thank you. Um, yes, just so you folks know, um, can't Californians for the Advancement of Midwifery which is Calm's sister organization secured um, funding to work with a consultant this year on a feasibility study for California Community College program for licensed midwives. So if anybody wants to um, collaborate on that um, with us, um, let me know. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, at this time, I do not see any additional requests or hands raised. And I think we can move on to agenda item number six, the uh, report from the task force and possible action on the midwifery and the medical issues. Tisa? Yes, this is Tisa Kareen. Um, so what I am going to, I guess, fill everybody in on is what I have been um, Keeping up to date on is the midwifery learning collaborative. Uh, the state of California has been approved 1 of 5 states in the nation for the Institute for Medicaid innovation. And what this is, is a. 3 year learning collaborative uh, convened by the Institute for Medicaid innovation. The collaborative is funded by the Kellogg foundation and will bring together multiple stakeholders who collectively seek to improve birth equity through the development of sustainable initiatives to advance midwifery-led models of care for the Medicaid population in their communities. Um, we Here in the state of California, the CNMA, which is the um, Nurse Midwives Association, are partnering with Best Start Birth Center, Beach Cities Midwifery, Antelope Valley Birth Center, Midtown Birth Center, Santa Rosa Birth Center, San Francisco Birth Center, Loving Way Midwifery, Eisner Health, and the California Nurse Midwives Foundation, along with um, the American Association of Birth Centers, Blue Shield Promise Healthcare Plan, the LA Care uh, Health Plan of Los Angeles, uh, the African American Infant and Maternal Mortality Initiative, along with the National Health Law Program and Maternal Child Health Access. All of these stakeholders will, here in the state of California, will be meeting and collaborating on how to. Um, improve access to midwifery care for through Medicaid uh, healthcare systems. So we are kind of in the beginning stages of this initiative where we're forming groups, goals, uh, what our timeline will be, what our initiatives will be, what we're actually working on. I can't really give you a ton of information beyond that because we're getting ready to meet next week, next Friday, the 15th for the California group. Or actually that might be the um, that might be the nationwide group that the five states that are meeting. This might be a California state in December and then an all states meeting in January. The all states 
all states meet every three months and get together and convene and talk about what the the overall goal is for all five states. Um, but this program has been funded for three years and there are some major players. I need that door closed. Um, there are major players in this initiative to make sure that um, that changes are being made, that our voices are being held, heard. There's lots of community support as well from state from um, mothers who are interested in midwifery care, so their voices are being held, heard in this initiative as well. Questions? Are you um, you you sound like you're one of the people who are at the meetings? Yes, I am. I am one of the birth centers that is um, in the thick of it. Oh yay! <laughs> that is perfect. Which on that front, I will say that there is a very large majority of CNMs uh, and CNM organizations that are heavily involved in this initiative, but they have absolutely welcomed LMs with open arms because they know that we also are very um, involved in here in California with Medicaid. There are a number of LMs obviously taking Medi-Cal right now, so they have not turned us away. There's Quite a, there's a whole roster that they have, even though I listed off all those birth centers, there's a number of LM practices that have been involved in this process as well. That's really great to hear. Um, has Calm been involved with the meetings at all? I'm not sure what their involvement is. And maybe maybe Rosanna Davis could uh, speak up to that, but I have no idea what her what that organization has has had any process. Sounds like mostly the, you're, you're still setting goals and things, but it, the overarching goal is to improve access. Yeah, there there's improving access and then also making sustainable changes so that it, it's sustainable for midwives to to provide this level of care and for it to be sustainable and affordable for us. So definitely, if we could talk about access to care, we're definitely on the agenda is making sure that we are getting fair and equal payment for services. Oh, that is really good news. <laughs> that is wonderful considering we give more intensive care and, and that needs to get paid for and we need to we need to not get paid according to the busy OB office hospital paradigm when we're giving so much more care and so much more attention and making a major difference in outcomes as a result. Um, we need to get paid for what we're doing that is above and beyond what's what's traditionally done through the medical system. So Tisa, is there anything that um, the MAC can do to support this work or something that you think the MAC should work on or with regarding Medi-Cal or? I'm not sure that um, at this moment, because there are a lot of people at the table right now and what is, um, been very promising is to see health plans actually at the table. So credentialing departments, um, we are really focusing in on the current credentialing process. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people already in play, probably what would be. Um, what I could see as a potential problem or barrier, what it's always been the biggest barrier for a lot of midwives is our malpractice insurance um, for LMs is very pricey and more built on a practice model. And it's pretty unobtainable for a single practice midwife who maybe is only caring for 20 to 30 clients a year. And the premium is pretty hefty. And then there's very limited access for LMs compared to CNMs. For malpractice insurance, um, as far as I know, there's really only one to two carriers nationwide um, that has really dwindled down in the last seven years that I've been carrying malpractice insurance, where I've had to switch uh, companies many times to 
to, because the carrier that I was with no longer is covering licensed midwives and they've dropped, they've, you know, they're dropping that service. So, um, I don't know what we could do as the Mac in supporting efforts to increase some kind. I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what we could do in that effort at all. But that is definitely something that would be worth focusing on because that's probably more LM private practice, uh, like a barrier than anything, because most of the practices that are taking Medicaid are big CNM practices that have, you know, maybe six or seven or eight midwives, and that's way more affordable for a larger practice. Is that Are there any questions or comments from the members? Is there any public comment? And the Q&A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, you can go ahead and type something in there or use the hand raising feature in WebEx. Or again, if you're on the phone, you can press star three to raise your hand there. Uh, first up here, we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, let me send you that prompt. Here you go, your yes. Is open. yes, it's me again. Um, I just wanted to confirm that uh, Calm has a team that is will be joining um, this collaboration um, going forward. Great, thank you for your public comment. Uh, this time I do not see any additional requests or hands raised. Okay. Um, so it sounds like right at, at this point, there's, there's not much that the MAC will be doing with this. Is that right, Tisa? Yeah, I feel like this is a, like, we don't need, um, this is a great initiative and there's a lot of people involved. All the right people are involved. I think just maybe I will just fill you guys in on updates, fill the midwifery community in at, at large, like what the initiative, where the initiative stands and what they're working on. I would be happy to do that. Then we can move on to agenda item number seven, the update on proposed regulatory language for the um, for the ALMAR, the licensed midwife annual report. Ms. O'Connor. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Um, just a quick update on the status of that reg package. We have put the package together. It's actually in its final stages of review with the board, um, and then it will be moving on to DCA. Um, so it's made great progress. We're almost there to ready to submit the whole thing. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions or comments? I think that's great. Um, Watch for working on it. And how about any public comments? Yeah, the Q&A window is open. Anyone wishing to make a public comment can do so by typing anything in there or again, raising your hand and calling users. You can press star three to raise your hand if you're not at a computer. Give you a few seconds here to queue up if anyone's interested. Okay, this time, Ms. Holzer, I'm not seeing any requests. All right. Okay. Um, can I ask, is the... Is the version that you submitted that draft available um, at, at the website? So um, right now it's because it's still in draft form. We have it posted to the website and I, I don't think, Carrie, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but I believe we posted on the website once it's noticed with the Office of Administrative Law. So first it has to go through uh, DCA before we do that. But um, it the whole package itself, I mean, it, it has the proposed language that, you know, the Council approved and the board approved, um, and then the other documents are basically um, answering a whole slew of questions about the impact and effect, the need, the justification, um, and and once that's noticed with OAL, we'll post that on our website for the public. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah. And will that be before the next March meeting of the MAC? Um, or after? I I would have to defer to Carrie. I because I, I don't know DC's current timeline right now, how, how quickly they're turning around reviews of rec packages. It it can take 
um, months is my understanding for it to go through all of DCA, but Carrie, I don't know if you have a better idea. Than I it's do. Um, not impossible for it to have already been submitted to the Office of Administrative Law by the next MAC meeting. And uh, once it gets noticed, then it, it is posted as uh, Ms. O'Connor said to the board's website. But it, it is the same language that the MAC approved and that the uh, uh, medical board approved. So nothing has, has changed with the actual language. Just, there's just a number of additional documents that are prepared and submitted as part of the process. Okay, thank you for that update. I was just curious. And I know some people are following it, so. Yeah, and I, I believe we also have, um, I believe we have a listserv where you can um, sign up, uh, you know, anyone um, to be alerted when there are legislative or regulatory changes um, proposed. I, I believe we have one. Um, so it's on our website. So if anybody wanted to be notified when um, it's posted, I believe that goes out through that listserv. That's correct, Maria. And there's one specifically yeah. for regulations on the subscribe page from the medical board website. Okay, thanks, Sean. Huh? So, if there's nothing else, we can move on to agenda item number eight, the update on midwifery related uh, legislation and sunset review process. Ms. Bone. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. This is Aaron Bone, the board's chief of legislation and public affairs. Since the max prior meeting, the legislature completed their work and adjourned for the year. They are scheduled to reconvene in Sacramento from their recess on Monday, January 3rd, 2022. On October 7th of this year, the governor signed SB 806 into law, which was the sunset legislation for the medical board, as long as, along with a few other health boards within the Department of Consumer Affairs. With regard to licensed midwives, SB 806 does the following. It authorizes the board to end the use of paper-based initial licensure and renewal applications. There's an increase to LM initial licensure fees from $300 to $450 and the renewal fee from $200 to $300. All licensees of the board, including licensed midwives, are required to have an email address and report it to the board no later than July 1, 2022. And then prior to referral to the field for investigation, the bill clarifies the requirement that quality of care complaints involving licensed midwives be reviewed by a medical consultant with education training, training, excuse me, and expertise in midwifery. As has been discussed a bit earlier, Senate Bill 65, the California Momnibus Act, was signed into law by the governor. Among other provisions, the bill requires the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, which is formerly the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, to contract with outside groups that train certified nurse midwives and licensed midwives to increase the number of students receiving quality midwifery education and training. During their meeting last month, the medical board members reaffirmed their support for an independent LM board. It also approved numerous other legislative proposals to strengthen the board's enforcement program, improve its financial position, and make some technical cleanup amendments to Senate Bill 806. As referenced earlier, the California Association of Licensed Midwives has requested the board co-sponsor legislation to establish a licensed midwife board. The board has not yet acted on this request, but I have begun a dialogue with calm representatives on this matter. This concludes my prepared remarks, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the members? Alrighty, is there any question, any public comment? The Q&A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. You can enter something in there or raise your hand. And again, call in users, you're welcome to press star three on your phone to raise your hand that way. Give everyone a few seconds here. Okay, first up we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, there you go. Should begin that request on your end. I just wanted to thank um, medical board staff and and the board um, for um, the recommendation for a licensed midwife board and and for opening up the dialogue on that. Appreciate uh, the efforts in that direction. Thank you. 
Thank you for your public comment. At uh, this time, I do not see any additional requests in queue. Thank you, Mr. Bone. I think we can move on to agenda item number nine, the program update. Um, uh, Ms. Moriarty. Thank you, Ms. Holzer. Please turn to tab 9A1 of the packet for the midwifery program licensing statistics. In the first quarter of the fiscal year 2021-2022, the board received five new applications, issued 11 new licenses, and renewed 42 licenses. Please turn to page 9B1. In the first quarter of the fiscal year 2021-2022, the board received 51 transfer of planned out of hospital delivery to hospital reporting forms for licensed midwives. Please turn to page 9C1 for enforcement statistics for licensed midwives. In the first quarter of the fiscal year 2021 2022, the board received two complaints and none were referred for investigation. Please turn to page 9C1. The board received one complaint for unlicensed midwives in the first quarter. Please turn to page 9C3. For the first quarter of the 2021-2022 fiscal year, the board received 51 transfer of planned out of hospital delivery to hospital reporting forms for licensed midwives and closed 57. Please turn to page 9C4. For the first quarter of the 2021-2022 fiscal year, the board received one transfer of planned out of hospital delivery to hospital reporting form for unlicensed midwives. Thank you. This concludes my program update. Are there any questions? Are there any questions then from the public members? Q and A okay. windows open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, go ahead and type anything in there or use the raise hand function of Webex and we can call on you. We've got a few more seconds here. Ms. Solzer, I'm not seeing any requests. Okay, well, thank you, Mrs. Ms. Moriarty. I think we can move to agenda item number 10, discussion on licensed midwife annual report compliance. Um, we put this on the agenda last time um, because we had the, you know, the summary and there were, I forget the exact numbers, but there were a large group of midwives who hadn't submitted their LMARs. And the question was raised whether there's something we need to do about that, but we couldn't, it wasn't on our agenda, so we couldn't really talk about it. So we put it on the agenda this time to, um, see if there's anything that we need to do or focus on to try and increase uh, better participation in, in, re, re, in doing the LMAR. It was like 100, um, what was it, Tanya? It was like 138 midwives who hadn't completed it, who should have? Uh, Ms. Holzer, it was 158 midwives that did not report. And I have a little more of the statistics I think I mentioned at the um, end of the last meeting, but I'll go over that again. Um, we had 35 that were delinquent with a California address, uh, 448 current with a California address. There were 25 delinquent with an out-of-state address and 54 current with an out-of-state address. So that gives you a little bit more of an idea, maybe why some were not reporting. Oh, so the, so the delinquents in the out-of-states are included in the 138, in the 158? That is correct. Like 60. Yeah, so really the number isn't that large considering. And we've, I, I know we've brought this up on the Mac many times before and in the past we've sent out 
you know, had staff send out emails to people. We've had, Calm has sent out um, reminders to people to do it. Um, and I'm not sure if those things that actually helped get more um, get more midwives to participate in the LMA are or not. Um, but that's what we have done in the past, and I'm not sure that we need to. If we feel like we need to do anything more at this point, does anybody on the council think we have to that we should take this up? Well, I don't know that, like, given the number, it's that important for us to be working on. But I wonder if um, it might be helpful for people to know what is the purpose of the licensed midwife annual report? How does it help midwives in the state to have our numbers current and correct? Um, you know, for instance, when I presented on VBAC to the board, I used those statistics to talk about how we're doing. And that was the original intent so that, you know, the medical board and the legislature could see how midwives in the state were practicing and what our outcomes were. And, and so if people are submitting their statistics and submitting them correctly and submitting them on time, then they get into that record so they can be used to benefit midwives. Um, I don't know that people really understand that it's, it's there so that we have a tool to advance midwifery in California rather than just be another onerous task to keep your license. Probably true that a lot of midwives don't understand it. Just so you know, um, midwives do get reminders to complete this. Um, it's just there's there's not disciplinary teeth for failing to comply. So the consequence is that right. you won't be able to renew your license. And in, until you comply, in, but if you comply late, then it's not right. contained in the statistical information. Um, but midwives do get reminders about this. Could could we add um, language to the reminder about why it's important to like why it's important for midwives and for California midwifery to have that information done in a timely manner? Or is the reminder, I don't know, written in stone and can't be altered? Like, if it's going to take a whole legislative or regulatory thing to update the reminder letter, that's way more work than anyone wants to do. I'm not sure if Ms. Uh, Morarity has uh, sample language accessible, um, but that might be something that you want to add to a future agenda item where you can see a sample letter and uh -huh. maybe you know work on the language. It does not require a legislative mm -hmm. or regulatory change. Okay, I I'd, I'd like to get that on the agenda. Um, as a California midwife for 19 years, I have seen many of those reminder letters <laughs> and uh, I think it could be done more effectively to convince people that it really is important. Claudia, um... I guess this is an agenda item, perhaps like just a little in service, like you guys I've seen other in services yeah. um, on the importance, then it would go into the public record and it then it could be like a short video <laughs> to, that could be passed around to people, you know, 
just so it's multi-dimensional because sometimes you know people really don't read letters but maybe like just a little in service because i too use those stats and it, it helps with work for equity so yeah sure i'm sure there are all kind of reasons why people aren't doing it and don't understand the importance of it okay so yeah and that that could be something that got sent out through um calm even and then we don't have to deal with all the regulatory approvals and things. But perhaps, Claudia, you could come to the next meeting with a maybe just a wording for it, and I'm sure staff yeah. would be willing to insert it into their reminder if they could. Okay. Well, let's get it on the agenda for next time. And and uh... this is Tisa. Um, I can someone remind me? Was there a worksheet or something that someone proposed? where midwives can collect that data before actually going online and filling it out because the online uh, submission of the LMAR is actually fairly difficult to get through. That's the, probably the bulk of the problem. But do I remember somebody talking about a worksheet that was formulated or somebody was working on that so the data could be collected before actually going in and, and going through the form online and submitting it? We just talked about it, but I don't remember if anybody was actually working on creating one. Okay. Are the challenges with inputting it into the software something that we can work on, or is that outside of our purview? Because you just said that one of the biggest barriers was actually entering the data. And so I'm wondering, is there anything we can do on that front? I think that was just recently updated and altered and um, it was not done in a way that is um, that matches the way midwives think about births and outcomes. Uh -huh. So it's, it's kind of backwards. So I found that it got more confusing to do and have gotten calls from midwives asking for help with it. Um, who know that I've trained on older versions of the form. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know that we're going to convince them to revamp the computer form again, but we could certainly work on explaining the way uh, the subtractive process that is being used as opposed to starting with everything and then breaking it down. Ms. Brigley, maybe I could uh, interject for a moment and, and I do have another member from NBC uh, IT here that might be able to, to join in and, and speak on it as well too. But the, the web application that we designed was built off the paper forms at the time, and then the paper forms um, were no longer being accepted by OSHPED anymore because there was no staff there to do the data entry. So, you know, everyone has to do the electric uh, input of that stuff. If, um, if there's a different method other than the flow of how the paper forms, you know, do it, and then we didn't see that. And so that that is, you know, it's basically based off of exactly how the paper forms would work. Um, I, I was talking with uh, another person who worked on the Elmar project here, uh, Natalie. You, you want to uh, talk about? She had some background on the uh, worksheet form. Natalie, you want to? Sure. Hi, this is Natalie Lowe with the Information Systems Office. I was involved in the uh, implementation of the new Elmar system. I've been involved with the midwifery program for several several years. Um, since the beginning of talks about revamping the system um, to the point of where we are today. Um, some brief background is that the new system is based on multiple individuals, programs, organizations, feedback on what data elements everyone would like to see within the system as well as what was within the scope of the laws that was currently written. There were many interested parties meetings. There were many discussions throughout MAC meetings for several years 
before we even began working on the new system. Um, as you know, OSHPED, which is now HKI, uh, they used to, or they still do, house the system. Um, but NBC was willing to take on the project of revitalizing and revamping the system, which was, um, I, I don't want to say a gift to the MAC, but in some aspects it, it was um, definitely above and beyond probably where we intended to go originally when we started discussing the revisions to the system. Um, the system as it currently is, again, is based on the feedback that we received prior to building and creating this system. Um, we sent out surveys to midwives uh, asking for feedback on how data should be collected and entered into the system. Uh, and, and this is the outcome. Uh, there have been discussions over the years of a worksheet to assist midwives in compiling their data before they even enter the Elmar system. Um, the last that I believe we discussed, this was uh, probably a year or so ago, Shamin Perez, a MAC member, had taken on the, the task of identifying the different elements that would be uh, beneficial to the midwives to collect in order to enter their information. That was a, a, a task item that she had um, I don't believe it went anywhere. I don't think she presented any work on that item. And then she was no longer on the Mac. So, uh, as medical board staff here, we're familiar with the system. However, we are not familiar with the midwives day to day practice and what would be beneficial to you. What are you looking for to help you? And I believe yeah. that's why Shaman had taken on that task as part yeah. of the Mac. Um, to present something and give us a, a, an idea of what midwives were actually looking for. So uh, I don't think that the medical board is against putting something out that would help by any means, but I think that task is is more on the MAC or the midwifery community to mm -hmm. come up with what you, what you want to see that would help you. And, and then medical yes. board staff, we'd be willing to work with you definitely um, to do whatever we can to assist the midwives. I will also say that um, the new system has been in place for a couple years now, and we receive very little calls or inquiries from midwives on how to enter their data. The first year there were some minor issues that needed to address and updates to the system to, to fix issues, but we're not seeing a high volume of individuals calling and saying, hey, you know, can you tell me what I should enter here or how I should enter it? So. Um, again, if, if you have more information than what we're being provided, we're, we're always open to, to hearing it and addressing it and, and making all of our lives easier. So I, I'll leave it at that. Natalie, please, please don't misunderstand me. The, the current system, I've, I've been on this from the very beginning when I think the first year nine maternal deaths were erroneously reported and I have seen improvement every single year. Um, and the system as it stands is really kind of fail safe. Um, it's done, it's an intuitive thing that um, it was approached from a computer, like, like you said, it, it was, com it was approached from a way that computer people think about it, not about how midwives think about it. So it's kind of backwards from the way that midwives think about their statistics. And so that was a little problematic at first, but once you, once you get the hang of it, it's super easy. Um, I agree that we used to we used to be able to download something from Manistats that gave us all the information so we could just put it in and um so i think that is what midwives need is some way of compiling as they go even if it's just a paper jot it down so that you know 
like every time you do a birth certificate, jot down the information on the form to so that you have your statistics at the end of the year. Um, I think that's definitely something that if we, uh, you know, got some uh, ideas on or something, you know, if, if we put some yeah. together with your guys' assistance, we could definitely send that out with the Elmar notices each year and post it on our website, you know, so year round midwives could right. be using those forms, compiling their data, and then when yeah, they go into Elmar, it's like filling out your taxes, you got all your paperwork in front of you kind of thing. That, that was kind of the design of the yeah. Elmar system was a turbo taxi kind of style thing. But if, yeah, if you don't have everything in front of you or it's not all in your head, it, it is a lot of data, yeah. Yeah. And this is so, I'd be happy to pick that back up. Can I just say that I'll, I'll go ahead and pick that back up from where Shaman left off, which sounds like nowhere. So I'll just go ahead and start um, because I have to do my LMARs this year too, just like everybody else. I'd be happy to work on a worksheet that would help uh, LMs. Mm -hmm. The app is going through all of my charts and trying to figure out which ones were um, transferred for X, Y, Z reasons and, and when they were transferred and why they were transferred, all that kind of stuff. So I'd be happy to pick that back up as I'm getting ready to collect that data myself right now. So if um, Sean, yeah, if whoever wants to email me so we can start getting together to start compiling that, I, I just need to know, probably take a good look at the LMAR so I can see what data that makes sense to me. As someone who does electronic charting, that might be really helpful. It might be helpful if somebody else joined me that doesn't do electronic charting, that does paper charting, to kind of have eyes from a midwife who doesn't do electronic charting, because mm -hmm. my dad is like a little bit easier to collect um, being on all online and not having to search through paper charts. That's great, Ms. Kern. I, I will definitely get an email out to you and Natalie and I's contact information. Um, Tanya, just on an aside, do we know has Osh H Kai requested the um, new Mac reporting window and an opening date yet, or do we know anything? We do we still wait on a request from them, or do we do it ourselves now? Um, not yet. Ha, uh, Miss Lowe might be able to help you a little more with that, but I think the reporting window will be opening on the first of January. Okay. So yeah, it, it might be opportune time to you know. Put all that together and get it at least ready for the next reporting season. Yeah, and if I could just make one suggestion too, or ju just throw it out there, this is Marina. Um, one thing too that you know I think could be a possibility and maybe helpful, um, maybe in addition to whatever worksheet is developed, um, is maybe a walkthrough. Um, you know, there had been some mention of a video or some type. Um, you know, you can, we can develop, well, I don't want to say we, I don't, I don't know if it'd be us or DCA, but um, I know DCA has done this for other programs is you can develop a, a walkthrough that literally guides a person through completing a form, whether it's an application or a reporting form. Um, and usually what you want to focus on is what are the areas that are the most difficult or there's the most confusion. And I think we can take whatever feedback we get from you know, the, the MAC members or the midwifery community um, on, okay, where are the areas that are the biggest problems that we can focus that type of, I'm not saying it would be a video, it doesn't have to be a video, it's just, that's just one medium, but, um, you know, something that walks um, folks through those difficult sections or those problem areas, because um, a lot of people are, you know, more visual, and yes, a worksheet is visual, but sometimes, you know, they want the, there's the audio with the visual, and, and you know, there's different formats to, to, to walk people through. So I think that could be an option as well. Yeah, I think we're talking with, I think we're talking about two separate things here. And one is to help people with the physical act of entering data. And the other is to assist with collecting data from all the charts. So, yeah, but both of I, I agree, both of them have some value. I can see the value yeah. of a video walking someone through the actual um, online version of the. Right. Yeah, our, our re recollection of the worksheet idea was that the worksheets were filled out per patient. Throughout the year, 
And then you had the folder full of those worksheets when you sat down to actually fill out your Elmar and you, you know, and then maybe that's where a video or some sort of tutorial kicks in to, you know, like on your TurboTax to add up these, you know, boxes and, and you know, fill it in here kind of a thing. So yeah, I know for me personally, it was like once I started my Elmar, I didn't know exactly what data I was going to be reporting on. So I'd have to look back in all my charts and go, I'd have to write down every single patient's name and when they delivered what the status was and it was a lot of information to compile and then I would get to like question 15 and I was like oh I didn't even compile that right and go find all those people and have right. to recollect so that zip the data cuts. collection is very helpful zip codes I when you know when I was up north I was doing births in nine different zip codes hmm. and um having to go back and count how many people were in each zip code you know so that kind of thing right but then you know when you get to filling it out and it's you know list all of your clients who didn't who weren't this and weren't that and didn't transport and weren't vbacks and that kind of subtractive Thing can be hard for people to figure out, like what they're what they're doing. You know, like what's supposed to. But once once you do it, then it's easier to figure out. But a tool to help com so a tool for people who wait no. Uh, like tutorial for people who are filling it out for the first time or need to remember after they've done it a couple of times. And then a tool for people to con collect the data through the year. Um, and like all pulled together with something about this is what this information is used for and why it's important to do it. So please do it on time so that we have your data. Great summary. It sounds like we need all three of those strategies. It would be helpful. Yeah. So I've got that, Claudia, you're going to come back to the meeting with some wording for to add to the reminders. And Tisa's going to start to work on a worksheet for collecting the data. And that was it, right? Yeah, let's let's do that and then we can focus more on a instructional video after we've done those two things. Maybe for our okay. next agenda, next meeting agenda. Okay. Good. Any other comments about that? I just wanted to say um the staff member who did this the history lesson on the process. That was helpful to me and um, I can see that she was invested in that and a few yeah. other staff members. So I just wanted to thank them. You know, I know it's a journey. It was a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess there, I, I guess we have to open up for public comment. Is there any public comment on this issue? The Q and A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, please indicate so by typing anything in there, or use the hand raising function of WebEx. Again, if you're on a phone in only line, you can press star three to raise your hand. Give me a few seconds here. First up, we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, you should be getting the prompt on your. Yeah, I just wanted to express my thanks and appreciation for you all taking this up and so very thoughtfully laying out um, some things that would be helpful. I think that the Elmar data collection and high participation is, is very important to the profession. So thank you. Rosanna, do you have any other additional comments as to what other barriers that you hear that midwives are facing at getting the Elmars completed? No, I think you guys talked it through pretty well, you know, and, and I would just affirm that it, um, a worksheet some worksheets would be really important to so you can compile the information you know what you're looking for ahead of time that's huge um but also a tutorial um i know when the, the elmar was first launched claudia did one for 
for uh, through CAM and people uh, found it very, very helpful. Um, and what was the third thing you guys were going to work on? Uh, the wording for the reminder. Oh, the, the motivation in the, and yeah, it, yeah. I, I, it's all, all three of those aspects I think will be critical. I think you can still find my tutorials on YouTube somewhere for the first couple of years. Yep. Okay, Claudia 2.0. <laughs> okay, so if there's no other public comments. Any additional requests at this time? Okay, so we can move on to agenda item number 11, discussion on training for MAC members. Danielle, I think we put your name on this only because it originally was brought up by you and we discussed it last meeting, um, but we wanted to see if there was anything more that you wanted to input regarding, regarding this topic. Oh, okay. Thanks for explaining that. I was like, hmm, did I? I know I missed one meeting, but I was like, okay. <laughs> also, I was prepared. Um, I think the last time it was clarified on the limits of training. So I don't know if I had anything more to add because it sounds like there were, I, what my takeaway was there was pro probably too many limitations. I will say this um, a public member or a member of the public contacted me um, and requested, um, I guess they were bringing up the point, there's no way to mentor people who want to serve on the board. So I just, since we're talking about, it, I just bring that up because they were asking and I was like, I don't know of anything or a process, but I guess they were thinking that might be helpful to get, for example, you said at the beginning, there's people are terming out. So then is there any preparation besides an announcement to, you know, replace people? So anyway, that's all I have. I do, I do like trainings uh, to advance what we, the work that we do at a higher level, not like um, harassment training and like that, but I just don't know how feasible it is. Well, there was um, one thing, you probably read the minutes, but the Carrie Webb did a, a presentation on the, um, Open Meetings Act and just how that works and how we're supposed to, you know, maintain separation and all that. And um, it was an excellent presentation. And so we decided to make that available to everybody. And um, did you get sent that? We talked about sending that to everyone when they become, when they get on the, um, on the council. And then what was the other thing? Let's go back. And the handbook, what was the other thing? I just read the minutes and now I'm blanking on it. I'm not sure, but who did we have a new staff member? You could acquire what she got. I mean, I've been almost three years, but yeah, I did get some things when I first joined. Um, I mean, you know, that's one. What do you call that? There are multiple ways to to train. That's pretty linear. It's the email and you click some links and you read it. It's nothing wrong with that. It's very helpful. I'm old school. I just like a kumbaya session, really, <laughs> like inspiration. Let's you know get out the the chart pad and you know like I like that kind of training. So, but you know, anyway. I don't think I've received everything from Tanya yet, but most of what I received was more. It was a handbook, but there wasn't. I don't remember there being a link to a training about the Open Meetings Act or any other videos or anything like that. So somehow, um, is there a link or what's the best way for new members to, to um, view that presentation? 
Ms. Holzer, this is Tanya Morarity. I believe I did send it out to a few members. Um, Ms. Webster may not have been a member at the time, so I'm happy to send that. I'll go ahead and send the link out to all of the MAC members again. Yeah. And it's probably just a good idea just to, whenever we have a new person, just send it to them so that they, you know. Absolutely. It's, it's not intuitive and it's, you know, so it's, and it's good information and just to know how we're supposed to act or not act, right? <laughs> I will include that in the procedural manual. Thank you. Okay, good. And does anybody else remember what we discussed last time? We discussed that and the handbook and was there something else? It feels like I'm forgetting something and I can't remember what it was. Maybe not. Ms. Holzer, I believe there was some training regarding regulations uh, that Ms. Abe mentioned at one of the prior meetings. Oh, thank you. It's coming back to me now. See, we don't meet enough to be remembering everything. I think it was, it's it's all resolved now, but I think what I said, because I was such a new member and given the responsibility to um, come up with the language. And when I worked with um, Dr. Um, the doctor, we both were asking questions about how to do this in the best, most effective way. And we just had felt like we needed more direction and more training. I think I, I think that's where the antithesis of this had started. So. Okay. All right, well, good. So if there's other, um, any other comments by the members? Uh, how about public comments? The Q&A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, go ahead and type anything in there or use the hand raising function in WebEx. And call in users, you can press star three in order to raise your hand if you're not at a computer. Give everybody a few minutes here to see if there's any public comments. Okay, at this time I'm not seeing any requests. All right, so then let's move on to agenda item number 12. Um, presentation by California Department of Public Health regarding newborn screening requirements and compliance. Mr. Domingo. Okay, I have a few uh, um, California Department of Public Health people here I'm going to be adding as panelists. Give me just a second, Ms. Holder. Mr. Domingo, uh, if you press star six on your phone, you should be able to come off and mute now. Um, can everyone hear me? We can. Okay, great. Let me get your um, presentation whenever started. You're... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just a second. Okay, you should be seeing that now and just go ahead and let me know as you'd like to advance the slides. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Um, hello, advisory committee members licensed midwives and meeting attendees. My name is Joe, and I also have my co-presenter, Tracy, who is the section chief of the newborn screening program. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our program and newborn screening and the unique position uh, midwives have in working with families to ensure this important testing is done. And now I will hand it off to um, the section chief, Tracy. Great, thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you again to the uh, the board and the committee members for giving us uh, this time to uh, make a presentation. Next slide. And uh, real quickly, um, I hope to take a couple minutes to go through just an introduction to newborn screening. Uh, have a couple minutes discussion about uh, the state regulations and policies um, in relation to uh, midwives and at a hospital birth. Uh, take a couple minutes and go through the actual screening process at a very high level. Um, and in doing this and taking the time to meet with you today, um, the program is really looking forward to developing a relationship with uh, the the board and the community to uh, increase midwives' knowledge about their responsibilities in relationship to newborn screening. And 
uh, how important the test is and um, also maybe working with you as a community to, uh, to uh, um, make sure th uh, uh, the regulations are followed, I guess. I guess there's no uh, better way to say it. Uh, so uh, next, next slide. So real quick, I'm going to start at the beginning. So what is screening? So screening in general is a public health measure designed to identify individuals in a population who may be at risk for an increased uh, or an increased risk for a certain disorder. So um, you know whatever uh, um, you you want to say, you know, a needle in a haystack, right? Uh, next slide. The newborn screening uh, specifically uh, can identify babies with certain serious disorders uh, so that treatment can be started right away. Uh, early treatment can prevent serious developmental delay, physical disabilities, and life-threatening illness. So um, doing the newborn screening, doing it in a timely manner, and uh, having uh, timely follow-up can really make a difference in these children's lives. Next slide. Uh, so newborn screening started back in the 60s with a condition called phenylketonuria, or PKU. And this is a metabolic disorder, and uh, two things happened. The first was they realized that if they uh, put the kid on a special restricted diet, um, the uh, developmental delay was dramatically decreased. The second thing that happened was a test was developed to make it easy uh, timely and affordable to uh, be able to do this test on every baby. And uh, screening for PKU became uh, routine uh, public health practice. So over the years, um, as testing methodologies for certain disorders has improved and treatments have de been development for some of these rare disorders, uh, things have been added to uh, the newborn screening programs. Uh, and in California specifically, we um, as we use as parameters uh, to decide what we're going to screen for here in California uh, based on uh, the federal recommended uniform screening panel. Next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so here real quick is a, a schematic of how California newborn screening program has uh, increased or, or grown over the years. So we started in 1966. In 1980, it became a, a state-run uh, centralized program, and two conditions were added, uh, hypothyroidism and galactosemia. In the 90s, we added hemoglobin disorders. In 2005, we added uh, a new technology, which meant we added a whole new group of metabolic disorders, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, we started with CF in 2007 and biotinidase at the same time, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, immunodeficiency in 2013, uh, adrenal dystrophy in 2016, uh, two more metabolic conditions, uh, lysosomal storage disorders in 2018, and just last year we added spinal muscular atrophy to our panel. Next slide. All right, um, so uh, as, as you can see from the quick run through the previous slide, um, we test for an extremely large panel of uh, genetic and congenital disorders that includes um, different types of disorders. And, you know, I just went through some of the names, but uh, problems with uh, endocrine, uh, hemoglobinopathies, uh, SMA is a neuromuscular disorder, and SCID is an immunolog immunolo immunologic disorder. The baby doesn't have a functional immune system. Um, for the most part, most of these disorders are very rare, but when we add them all together, uh, basically, you, you know, somewhere between 1 in 500 and 1 in 600 infants uh, will be identified with uh, one of these conditions by our program. Um, and the treatments for these conditions vary widely, and some examples uh, include, you know, uh, hormone replacement for hypothyroidism, uh, di dietary restriction uh, for some metabolic conditions, um, and even uh, some high-tech things. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, treatment for SMA routinely now is gene therapy. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
So um, because of the importance of newborn screening and all the benefits, uh, it, it is mandated uh, in the California Code of Regulations. And uh, here's, here's um, the, the link to the, the code. Um, it sets uh, all the parameters for the program. Um, it includes uh, uh, regulations such that the families can only refuse on religious ground. Now, as a program, we don't ask for specific documentation on why they're refusing, but we do ask them for a signed refusal. Um, it covers the fee for the uh, program, which is currently $176.25. And that fee covers just about all of the program work, um, from paying for the courier to pick up the sample and bring it to the lab, um, to a lot of the uh, diagnostic testing that needs to be done to make a diagnosis. Um, it also sets the responsibilities for stakeholders. And uh, we'll take a minute and go through some of the main stakeholders that are main responsibilities for uh, home birth providers like licensed midwives. Um, and uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the things the regulations mentioned is education. So the, the regulations say that uh, birth attendants should provide uh, our uh, information, our pamphlet to, to all families during pregnancy. And the regulations also say that at the time of the test, it should be provided. So according to the regulations, uh, birth attendants should be uh, providing this information and talking to the family about newborn screening twice. Um, and it's really important to remember that uh, you know, the way this is approached with a family can really make a difference in their acceptance of newborn screening and uh, agreeing to have the test done. Uh, next, next slide. All right, so this is just the language about collecting uh, newborn screening. Uh, so let's start with uh, the, the fact is that a birth attendant either needs to do the newborn screen, uh, uh, provide for it to be collected, or to uh, obtain a, a, sign, a signature that the family refuses. And this can all be done on the test request form, and uh, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, the other thing it talks about is uh, uh, transit time. So, uh, well, actually, let me go back. I don't think I mentioned it. It's in the log. But um, uh, the regs say uh, that the screen should be collected between 12 and 24 hours. And this is really important because, um, obviously, the early, earlier collected, the quicker it gets run. Uh, quicker uh, the the information is called out to to the doctor, the quicker we can get the kid on treatment. Um, so, uh, in that vein, uh, the regs also talk about the idea that um, once a sample is drawn, it needs to be dried for three hours, but it should be given to the uh, the department contracted courier either on the same day um, or the next day. Next slide. So here is the newborn screening card, again, and a sample should either be collected, or arranged, or a refusal signed. And there is a place on, if you see on the left is that what we call the test request form part of it, um, there is a place to document uh, that it's going to be done somewhere else or that a family has refused and a place to sign. Um, it's really important that the form be uh, filled out completely and legibly. Um, on the the right side is the actual uh, filter paper where the blood spots are collected, and we won't get into those details today. Um, but it is important that, uh, that uh, all circles are filled completely. Next slide. Um, when you see the, the form, it's a whole big packet. In addition to the white one we just saw, there is yellow, pink, and blue copies. So the yellow copy is the attendance copy, and they need to keep that in their records for documentation that the test was done or refused. Um, the pink and blue go to the family. And uh, it's really important that they get that, because A, they can bring that to their doctor, um, who can use the information on it to uh, make sure they get uh, results from the program. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the other part of it, the blue part, uh, 
has important HIPAA information and uh, information on uh, the ability the ability to uh, have the blood spot uh, destroyed once after testing is done. Uh, next slide. So, um, oh, are they in the wrong order? Uh, we're missing the. Well, we'll we'll go through this one. I think I'd wanted the the result mailer slide first, but we'll go through this quick. So, um, actually, can you go to the next slide? I apologize. All right. So. Uh, the important part, the results, right? So um, a copy of the results are sent back to the, the uh, person who, the birth attendant who collected the form, and also to the, uh, the community uh, PCP or pediatrician uh, if one is listed on the form. And usually it takes about 10 to 14 days to, to receive these results. Okay, can we go back to the, the previous schematic? I apologize that they were in the wrong order. Okay. so. You know, uh, really high level, that is the, the newborn screening process. But what happens when uh, there's a problem? What if a sample needs to be recollected that we couldn't run it? Or uh, what happens if something's positive? So this is just a, a quick schematic. So obviously the baby's born, uh, the, the specimen is collected at 12 to 48 hours, it's sent to the lab, uh, the lab does their job and runs all the testing. Um, uh, if anything needs to be followed up on, the laboratory will let our follow-up staff know. And uh, because California is so big, that's regionalized, and we call them our area service centers. Um, so the lab will provide the information about the, the positive or the inadequate to the, the ASC staff, as we call them. Uh, the the follow-up staff will then notify the baby's pediatrician. They will discuss what needs to be done. Um, and for a positive test, they will discuss a referral to a California Children's uh, Special Care Center um, for uh, consultation and possible uh, appointment or, or evaluation with a specialist who is knowledgeable with that condition. Um, this happens by phone. It all happens in our computer system, too. Um, so once that is done, all the follow-up would be arranged, and generally that includes um, uh, confirmatory testing during samples for confirmatory testing, and uh, you know any uh, examination or evaluations that are necessary by the specialist. Uh, once that's all completed, the specialist will either uh, make the diagnosis and start the child on a treatment plan, or rule out the diagnosis. And the specialist provides that information back to the program and then we can close out the, this process to newborn screening. Um, and as midwives, uh, a lot of times we find that, you know, you are the ones we get back to, so we uh, find ourselves working with the, the midwives who are the birth attendants often to uh, walk, work with the family to find, a, find a, a center to work with or to have a sample redrawn. Uh, next slide. Okay, we did that one. Next one, okay. Um, so having gone through all that, I think one of the major points I like to point out that uh, newborn screening isn't just a blood test. It's a very uh, interwoven uh, process, and there are many stakeholders, including our families, the birth attendants who collect the samples, uh, the courier, the lab, right, the, the follow-up staff, um, Everyone and everyone works together. Um, the other part of this is, you know, in the vein of it's not just a blood test, it's we like to think of it as a process from beginning to end. And that starts with education. Um, education to the families, education about how to collect a sample and when to collect a sample, uh, education to the lab about making sure they call things out in a timely manner. Um, Obviously, the follow-up is important, right? The reason we do this is so that we can get these kids on treatment early and really uh, improve their prognosis. And uh, finally, evaluation of the program. You know, uh, we want to make sure we're doing the best job we could, we can. So, um, you know, we, uh, you know, look at the data that we have and, you know, really try to figure out and work with our, our partners and stakeholders to see what we can do better. Next slide. 
Um, so, uh, you know, uh, newborn screening is important, and it's important for uh, babies who are born at home, too. Um, you know, really uh, quick here, uh, NBS is life-changing. For a child who has one of these conditions, it can, it can make all the difference in the world. Um, newborn screening is a multifaceted process with many stakeholders. Um, it takes a village, so to speak, really for everyone to be doing their job. Um, NBS advances a health equity framework. Um, uh, you know, we really think it's important that uh, babies born at home have the same access to to this test as 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 others. And you know, finally, again, you know, newborn screening is mandatory, and we are we are working to to get the word out in the home birth community that um, you know they have certain responsibilities in in, in the newborn screening process. Next slide. All right, Joe, you want to wrap it up for us? Yes, thank you, Tracy. Um, to kind of give my summarizing uh, thoughts, um, informing our work in newborn screening and especially throughout my career has been significantly influenced by my public health hero, the Right Honorable Sir Michael Marmot. Um, who famously stated um, in my first APHA conference, give every child the best start in life. Again, I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity for us to provide a background on newborn screening and midwives role in the process. The program looks forward to working with the board and the midwife community to increase awareness about newborn screening and making sure that every child gets the best start in life. Uh, please, um, next slide, please. Please visit us at, at the website listed and feel free to reach out to us with, uh, with your questions about the program and how to get involved. And I yield back, thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Joe. And, and, and crew. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that we specifically asked you if you would uh, include in this presentation was um, w whether you were having problems with midwives submitting the newborn screenings and why you were coming to us with the program because we, you know, it's a, it's a very well program, well-known program. And so you were saying that there were some issues with licensed midwives in particular. And could you uh, address address that at all? Hi, yeah, um, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, I think we're trying to get the word out there. Um, I think there are midwives who don't understand that it's mandatory. Um, I think we've had midwives who have, um, uh, particularly with when it's not drawn. I mean, you know, we accept that, you know, families will refuse, but, um, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we do get the paperwork when a family refuses, that we do get a signature is, is uh, really important to us. You know, we want to we wanna have documentation. The midwife really should want documentation too, so it doesn't come back, it doesn't, you know, come back to them, you know, that it wasn't offered, you know, that there's no proof that it wasn't offered. Um, you know, I have a couple examples. I've been with the program a while now, and uh, we had a pair of brothers who, uh, family, they were like the fourth and fifth kids of a, of a family of like five, and um, two boys both had PKU, it, it turned out, and um, luckily the midwife had had signed refusals, so, uh, you know, she had done her part to, to uh, in, ensure, ensure um, that, that you know she was she uh she was covered you know she wasn't she wouldn't have been able to uh been sued or anything like that um i i um that for the for the most part i think that that's you know those are the things we do um it's also uh joe works a lot with um uh the birth registrars so in addition to our regulations for the birth attendants, we ask the uh, birth registrars, you know, to provide us uh, documentation of each birthday register. So having the midwives make sure they 
fill out uh, one of our forms for every baby and providing that pink and blue to the family that they can bring copies to the birth registrar where it has all the information we're asking for is really helpful too. Yeah, I hope that helps a little. Do you have any numbers on like how many midwives are not completing the newborn screening or? Um, well, we only know what we know, right? And um, just off the top of my head, I haven't looked this year. But last year, like if I look on, you know, uh, the website about how many the documented uh, attended births there were and what we get, it's probably only about 75%. So, you know, if, if the website, you know, if the midwife website says, you know, there were 5,000, uh, you know, they attended last year, you know, we probably have records for, you know, just over 4,000, you know, that we received the forms for. Well, that's a significant amount. If if you really think 25% of babies aren't of home birth babies aren't getting screened, yeah. Well, that that's that we know about, right? Um, they could be midwives could be using private lab, right? There are a couple companies who will do this. You know, if you have a family who's particularly um, nervous about the state having their information, but or understand the importance of newborn screening, they might you know, work with the, the midwife to send it to a private lab. I don't know how often that happens. We don't get documentation or good documentation. So that's what we're working on. Yeah. Um, you know, we're also interested in working, uh, I think we think it would be great to be able to, once licensed your midwife, to be able to send them a packet, right? Once they get their license, to be able to send them a packet about newborn screening. Here we are. This is what you need to do. Here's our number. We'll get you set up. We'll get you supplies. Mm-hmm. I find it hard to believe that midwives aren't informed about the program. I mean, maybe it's very possible, but. I, th I think they are at a high level, um, but I don't know if that all, and I think, you know, I mean, there's a whole group that are incredibly engaged that we work with, and, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, they're amazing providers. But I think there are others that, you know, uh, you know, maybe are a little nervous about uh, doing the draw or, you know, just feel they have so many other things going on. Um, uh, we used to charge midwives. I didn't mention that when I talked about the fee. I meant to. Um, you know, it's just within the past few years that we've changed our billing for home births that the, the bill will go to the family, not to the midwife. So I think that was a, a block at some point for some midwives. They were unwilling to and not wanting to deal with having to, you know, uh, get billed and, and provide the the payment. Do you have any kind of an idea of like what part of the, are, are, are the, is there a majority coming from any certain part of the state or anything like that? Uh, something where we could, some area that we could concentrate on or do you have that kind of information or no? Um, not offhand, not offhand. Um, Again, we don't know what we know, but you know we uh, did work with Com to put we we did work with you to do a, a listserv blast with the letter we wrote. We're working with Com to uh, do a newsletter, so you know hopefully as we do more outreach, we'll we'll have a better feeling for that. That's a lot. I mean, twenty five. If that's true, twenty five percent is a lot. That that is concerning. Yeah, yeah. You and know, again, my, that's just off of the top of head of probably last year's number. Rarely happens. Rarely, rarely does someone not get screened. And it, the people who don't want to are the people who are afraid of government, you know, yeah. is having the storing the blood of their baby. That's an issue for people. But very around here in the Bay Area, it's pretty rare. So, but maybe in other parts, it's a bigger issue. I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, truly appreciate your, you know, being able to come to you and start thinking about this and maybe thinking about, you know, ways we can uh, do our best to reach everybody. So I know that, um, you know, the whole blood issue, the storing the blood and genetic information and, and that research is an issue, but also I've heard from midwives, there's a number of barriers for home birth midwives with small practices to be able to get it done and get it in and all of that. 
And I know that there are some people who are attending, midwives who are attending, who've talked about those barriers. And I wonder if we could hear from some of our attendees and maybe you could get some more insight into why. Because honestly, when you said that you thought it was 25%, I was like, oh, well, that's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> and, and yes, it's a significant number, yeah. but 75% um, is better than I was expecting to hear, to be honest. Uh -huh. Uh, what kind of barriers, Claudia? I'm just, I'm just interested. Well, that is, that is, uh, that's all us know. That's not, I mean, a, a portion of the the 75 percent that we hear about are refusals. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know there's issues with with the couriers. There's issues with um, the timing of things. There's issues. I don't know. I know that. Um, that there are people in the audience who have been very vocal about why it's so difficult for midwives. Um, Do you want me to when, go ahead and go for public comment? I'm sorry. I think that might that there's probably people who want to talk about it. I know when I was practicing um, in LA uh, between 2015 and 2017, it got changed so that results would only be reported to physicians, which was a huge problem because people would put down the pediatrician that they thought they wanted to use, but the physician had no idea who these people were, you know. Um, so it sounds like you're you're now notifying the midwife who is the care provider for the baby at that early stage. Well, but that always, would be well, we sent it to both. It, it, you know, obviously it's, we send it to who is listed on the form they give us. So if they put their correct information as the person who collected mm -hmm. it, results will definitely go back to them. Okay. I've never not yeah. gotten results ever. And from 2015 to 2017, I always got the results. Never stop. Our our rep told us that we could not be on there as the baby's provider. It had to be a physician. The results would only be reported to a physician. Well, I think maybe that that was trying to get so that we could send it to two different people. That you would get yours as the person who drew it and the attendant. And you know, we wanted to back up. You know, as the the community caregiver. Well, yeah. I'm glad to hear that's not the case because for many, many homeborn babies, you know, the pediatrician is in name only, yeah. you know, and it's the midwife who's going to be doing the follow up. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Okay, um, uh, Sean, I guess we can, if there's no more comments from the members, we can open it up for public comment. Yeah, the, the Q&A window is open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Uh, please type something in there or just go ahead and use the hand raising function in WebEx. Any call-in users can also raise their hand by uh, dialing star three on their phone. Uh, first up, we have Madeline Weisner. Madeline, you should be getting a prompt on your side to open your line. There you go. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Madeline Weisner. I'm a licensed midwife. Um, many of my patients uh, do not want the newborn screening because they don't want um, they don't want the government having their information for sure, and they don't necessarily realize that the government is going to already have their information. Um, but one question that I have is the regulation covers the fee. Does it cover, does that mean that it pays the fee? Because all of my, all of my patients are getting bills regardless yeah. of if they have insurance or not. And many, yeah. many clients don't want it because they don't want to pay for it. Okay. Yeah, no, no, the, the, the regs cover how much the fee is, but, uh, 
there is a there is a fee for every test, and uh, you know uh, families families do get billed. You know they get a form with the bill for their medical or or um, uh, insurance information, but but they will get billed. Yeah, and um, you know it should be covered by insurance. It should be covered by insurance. So um, I I won't say that I it is a problem. We realize that um, and. Uh, you know, they hopefully, you know, they should be able to work with their their coverage provider to to get it covered. All right, that looks like uh, Madeline's gone back on mute, so I assume that's the end of her public comment. Um, next up, we have Rosanna Davis. Rosanna, you should be getting the prompt on your side there. There you go, Rosanna. So, Please go ahead. yes, Rosanna Davis. Um, so, so for many years, um, I would say for for the fifteen years that I was in active practice, um, insurance probably only paid about ten percent of the newborn screen fee uh, through private insurance when I uh, direct build it. So that might present another obstacle for folks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was whenever we tried to, um, you know, go back to the insurance companies, they would say, oh, no, that's just, it just rolled into the five nine the fifty nine hundred you know the global fee. It's just you can't bill for it extra, so they wouldn't pay for it. it it's true that there's an issue with cost. Okay, this time I don't see any additional requests in queue. Well, thank you um, for 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 your work on this. If there's anything you can think of that the Matt can try and help you with to improve the screening of the of the newborn. To, Ms. Holzer, I think uh, okay. Madeline Weisner has one more uh, comment to make. I'm going to try to open her line again. Madeline, if you can. There you go, Madeline. Yeah, I, I do. Um, m many of my my clients are uninsured. And cannot, you know, it's a real hardship for them to pay any testing fees. And sometimes, um, you know, as a practitioner, I will just pay their newborn screening fee. But I'm wondering if there's any funding available for folks who don't have insurance or whose insurance won't cover it. Because it it's completely inappropriate for it to be bundled with global maternity care because it's a different patient. It's a baby, not a mother. Okay, interesting. That's an interesting perspective. And unfortunately, I d I don't know of any uh, any coverage for it. You know, if the baby's um, you know for an uninsured person, uh, we can you know I guess take a look. Um, can um, but nothing that I've ever uh, nothing that I've ever known of or kind of have been informed of. You know that people have found. You know I. You know, uh, it's not a new problem, as you as you all are probably well aware. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think our assumption was, uh, you know, that it could be bundled with everything else. But you're right; it's a different patient, so that does make it harder. I don't know; if I've ever looked at it from that perspective. All right. Well, thank you very much. And like I said, if there's anything you can think of that the Matt can do to assist in your efforts, um, let us know. <laughs> and thank you again. We appreciate all the, the feedback and, and the conversation. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can move on to um, agenda item number 13, discussion and possible action on the 2022 Council meeting dates. Um, so I guess 
Do you want to just take each one, like the March meeting? Um, uh, why don't I just propose March 10th for our March meeting? Do we have a second for that? This is Tisa, I second. Ms. Holzer, do you want to do, just do a slate so and see if that can get through? Try to form a consensus so there only has to be one vote? Okay, all right, so let's see. It's March 10th will be the first one, and then how about August 11th? Do I have a second? Yes, this is Tisa, I second that. Okay, and then how about December 8th? Second. Yep. Okay, so. Wait a minute, wait, I'm looking at my academic calendar here to see, like, this is the end of finals week, so it's huge for me to be here. Um, so we're looking at when in August? August, well, we, August 11th. Okay, as opposed to the fourth. Okay, and then um, the last one. I just chose December 8th because it was the farthest away from the holiday season. Yeah, that's definitely better than the 15th. Okay. Okay. If March 3rd is equally good for the other members, I would prefer that one. My kids don't have school on March 10th. I can make it work, but it'll be harder. Um, I can make it work. I can make it work. I can make it work. Yeah, that's fine for me. Thank you. Okay, so then what we're looking at is March 3rd, August 11th, and December 8th. Do I need a, a second for that? Second. Ms. Holzer, are you, are you making the formal, you're the one making the motion? Yes, I'm making the motion that these be our dates for the coming year. Okay. This is Monique and I second it. Um, do we have to ask for public comment? That is protocol. Okay, let's open it up for public comment. Anyone wish to break a public comment? Uh, you can go ahead and raise your hand or type anything into the Q&A window. Go ahead and call on you. I do have to stop my share here to see the Q window. Q and A window. Give everyone a few more seconds here. This time, Ms. Holder, I'm not seeing any requests. Okay, perfect. And can Ms. Moriarty, can we please perform the, the roll call? Yes. Ms. Abe. Yes. Yes. Ms. Brelia. You're muted, Claudia. Ms. Oops, Claudia. I guess I was unmuted before. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Kareen? Yes. Ms. Webster? Yes. And Ms. Holzer? Yes. Thank you. Okay. We have our new date next year. Woohoo. All right. Then our last agenda item is number 14 future agenda items. Um, we have to, uh, in, in addition to all our standing agenda items, the legislative review and the program update and everything that staff does every single time, we have, we put on the, for the next meeting, the, um, uh, to, to discuss, discuss some possible action on uh, wording to clarify the process of how a school gets approved for California licensed midwives. Um, wording for 
let's see, so uh, wording for reminders for the LMAR and the worksheet, I guess we can, do we need, does those need to be separate or can they just be the same agenda item? Right, we can just put them separately because two different people you are can working. have one agenda item and break it up as like part A, part B. Okay, yeah, let's do that. So wording for the reminders for the LMAR and the, the worksheet for the M, uh, LMAR. Do we want to do um, PISA uh, Medi-Cal task force update? And this would be in March? Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Um, Have I missed anything? Do, do, we, need, Holzer, do we need to put Ms. on Holzer, the, the, the discussion of suspending meetings? Can we even do that? Yeah, well, is that in our, in our realm? Well, I, I think it's a statutory requirement. Mm. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, there wouldn't be any use in discussing it then. Is that what, is that what you mean? No, I mean, we can take another look at it, but also, it, I mean, you're, you're the chair of the MAC, and so you don't have to put it on the agenda if it's not something that you agree with anyway. I'm definitely, I'm open to talking about it. I'm not, not in agreement with it, but. What do the other MAC members think? Um, so I actually think that uh, there's a valid, um, dang, my computer, sorry, keeps going off. Uh, some valid arguments in what uh, Rosanna Davis said. And I, if it's something that we have control over, which I don't know that we do have any control over stopping meetings and um so I, if it's something we don't have control over then there's no point if, if we're statutorily required to have a mac board and and conduct three meetings a year then that like our our arguments and our discussion isn't going to change anything and we're just wasting our time with that and we should put our focus and energy where things matter because that was part of the argument too that we're not going to waste our team time on things that that don't matter so Well, it looks so like the, the statute meant. under 2509, it says that um, basically the MAC has to exist and it sets forth some basic um, who the, what the membership is. And it says the council shall make recommendations on matters specified by the board. So statute does not set forth that there has to be uh, meetings or even you know a certain number of meetings or meetings at all well i will say in the time of covid that we're probably not spending all the money on travel so i imagine we're saving some money right now with these webex meetings am i correct i think i i think it's okay to just have it as a topic of discussion you know since the public is in the you know, someone from the public brought it up and we serve the public. So I, I don't disagree with discussing it. Um, but I mean, I guess we're not discussing it right now, <laughs> you know, like the pros and cons. So I don't, yeah. I don't see any fault in just discussing it. We were trying to figure out if it was something within our control to even put it on the agenda, I guess is what we were trying to figure out. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, um, I don't know. Is it? I think, can we just get an answer right now? Can you put it on the agenda? Well, it sounds like we have to have a Mac, but that the number of meetings is not explicitly specified. So that part might be open for discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I just didn't, I'm, I mean, if I don't know how much money you're, it's saving in the sense and the way budgets are allocated, there's no say that that would go to make us independent midwifery board. So, 
I don't know. I just think it's, you know, it's not like we're, I think there's benefits to just to meeting. And if you don't meet, then people might say, well, you're not meeting, therefore you're irrelevant. So I, I don't know if you want to go down that into, rabbit hole. We're getting yeah, into we're the merits now. So it sounds like maybe you want it as an agenda item. So. Okay, we can put it on as an agenda item. Yeah, I mean, you just th this is just for for discussion. In the end, um, you know, you you'll work this out with uh, you know yourself and executive staff, and then propose it to the board. Okay, sounds good. All right, discussion regarding suspending the meeting. Ms. Holt, we also have the three vacant positions that will be voted on. That's right. Good catch. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll be we'll be actually reviewing candidates, right? Because the call is going out now. Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Anything else anyone can think about? Is there any public comment on future agenda items? The Q and A window is open. Anyone wishing to make a public comment? Uh, please enter something in there or raise your hand using the WebEx function. Give everybody a few seconds here. This time, it's over. I'm not seeing any requests. Okay. Then I think we have our agenda for next meeting and I think then that means that we can adjourn the meeting. Right? <laughs> okay, so the meeting is adjourned. We'll see you all in March. <laughs>